glad. And we will go as far as the New Testament is concerned many years later to the time of the writing of the first letter to the Corinthians. That is, to the Lord's church in the city of Corinth in Greece and Achaia. Now they were having a lot of problems in that church of various kinds. One of them was about the resurrection of the body. Some were actually saying, well, the resurrection of the body, not Christ's body, but the resurrection of human bodies had passed already. In the process of correcting them, the apostle drops back to lay some groundwork. <coughs> and he makes it clear in the first four verses of 1 Corinthians 15 what he had preached to them that converted them from paganism and heathenism to become Christians as that term is defined and used in the New Testament of the Christ. And you'll see that in verse 3 he said, For I delivered unto you first of all that which I also received, how that Christ died for our sins according to the Scriptures, and that he was buried, and that he rose again the third day according to the Scriptures. And then he cites a number of witnesses to the resurrection. But then he begins to point out that if Jesus Christ of Nazareth is not the Son of God and is not raised from the dead, everything about the Christian faith is fruitless, is worthless, is vain, and in fact, a big lie. In verse 12 of 1 Corinthians 15, the apostle wrote, Now if Christ be preached that he rose from the dead, how say some among you that there is no resurrection of the dead? But if there be no resurrection of the dead, then is Christ not risen? And if Christ be not risen, then our preaching is vain. And your faith is also vain. And vain means pointless or worthless. Yea, and we are found false witnesses of God because we have testified of God that He raised up Christ, whom He raised not up, if so be that the dead rise not. For if the dead rise not, then is not Christ raised. And if Christ be not raised, then your faith is vain. Ye are yet in your sins. Then they also which are fallen asleep in Christ are perished. If in this life only we have hope in Christ, we are of all men most miserable. But now is Christ risen from the dead and become the first fruits of them that slept. For since by man came death, by man came also the resurrection of the dead. Now the point I want to make this morning is that how is it that people can read and understand the scriptures regarding the resurrection of Christ, see the significance of it as Paul by inspiration of the Holy Spirit employed it to show that if you remove the truth of the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead, then you removed everything there is about the gospel of Jesus Christ, as of course would be true of any fact of the gospel. But when you read Romans 6, where he reminds Romans, the Roman Christians in the church there, of what they did in becoming Christians and exactly when their sins were forgiven, exactly when they became Christians. He points out, Romans 6, 3 and 4, that they were buried with Christ in baptism. That like as Christ was raised up from the dead by the glory of the Father, even so we also should walk in newness of life. In other words, you're a new creature in Christ, and you're a new creature when you're baptized into Christ for the remission of sins. Galatians 3, 27, Acts 2, 38. Now the point I'm making is, there's nothing in the New Testament that says, that authorizes, that even intimates 
that those who are Christians, as you read of them in your own Bible, and you have read it this past week, haven't you? Uh, maybe the week before or last month. And you have read of the Lord's will and teaching on the resurrection. You answer that as God searches your mind with you. And of course he already knows the answer as you do. But the point is simply this. There's nothing in the New Testament that teaches in any form or fashion. But this day should be a special day among Christians. To celebrate the resurrection of Jesus Christ. It's interesting how people do that. When they know they have no authority from Jesus Christ himself in the New Testament to do it. Now here's what they do have authority to do. They have authority to observe the death of Jesus Christ. Every first day of the week. Acts chapter 20 and verse 7. 1 Corinthians 16, 1 and 2. To show forth his death till he come again. This do in remembrance of me. Now there's New Testament authority. It's a strange thing to me that people say, oh, how much we love the Lord. But you don't love his word. Jesus said, if you love me, ye will keep my commandments. Well, I just don't think. I don't care what you think. It's the Lord's thinking recorded in his word that makes the difference. For all scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness that the man of God may be perfect, truly furnished unto every good work. Again, 2 Timothy 3, 16 and 17. It is the perfect meaning the complete law of liberty. James 1 verse 25. Which James in teaching there says we ought to be looking into it to learn the will of the Lord and put it into practice in our lives. Why call you me? Jesus asked in his earthly ministry, ministry. Why call you me? Lord, Lord, and do not the things which I say. But many are wearing his name along with no telling what other kind of names. And they're calling him Lord, Lord. And they're doing as they please. How is it then that you can read Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John? And we read Matthew 28. And we read how Paul preached it as a significant part of the gospel. That is the resurrection of Jesus Christ. And yet, they can't read and understand what is said in the book of Acts chapter 2 on the first Pentecost following the resurrection of Christ. They can't read the inspired sermon that Luke by inspiration recorded that is the first full preaching of the gospel. Remember, we've read about the resurrection of Christ. It's not anything anybody wants to put down. In fact, it must be extolled. As Paul did in teaching the Corinthian brethren 2,000 years ago in writing part of the New Testament. But I would like to begin and read with you, if you'll read with me, from Acts chapter 2, beginning in verse 22. Now this is not just taking up space in your Bible. This is information you need to know, and it pertains to the resurrection of Christ as well as various other things. But our emphasis today is on the resurrection of Christ. On what the Bible says about it. Now, somebody says, well, what, what do you people believe on that? That's the wrong question. People believe anything and everything. The true and right question is, what does God's Word, the Bible, teach about it? For it was given, as I quoted a while ago, Paul's writing to Timothy, to enlighten us, to instruct us, to guide us, to lead us. So now listen to what Peter said as he stood up with the other apostles. Guided by the Holy Spirit, the third person of the Godhead, Luke recorded it later inspired of the same Holy Spirit, writing part of the last will and testament of Jesus Christ. And here's what Peter said to those folks gathered there on that day. Ye men of Israel, hear these words. Isn't that interesting? Don't just look around about you. Don't have some sort of spasm fit. The gospel message is a sane message, an intellectual message, a rational message. Ye men of Israel, hear these 
words. Paul would later tell Timothy, the young evangelist, preach the word. Be instant in season, out of season. Reprove, rebuke, and exhort with all long suffering and doctrine. For the time will come when they will not endure sound doctrine, but they shall heap unto themselves teachers, having itching ears, and shall be turned from the truth unto fable. He says, ye men of Israel, hear these words. That is, get your mind in gear to listen to the words I'm going to say to you and understand the meaning of those words and the message and what I'm about to say. Jesus of Nazareth, a man approved of God among you by miracles and wonders and signs, which God did by him in the midst of you, as ye yourselves also know, him being delivered by the determinate counsel and foreknowledge of God, ye have taken and with wicked hands have crucified and slain. Whom God raised up, having loosed the pains of death, because it was not possible that he should be holden of it. For David speaketh concerning him, I foresaw the Lord always before my face. For he is on my right hand, that I should not be moved. Therefore did my heart rejoice. And my tongue was glad. Moreover also my flesh shall rest in hope. Hope meaning expectation. With an earnest desire to receive what we have a right and are taught to expect. Now how does flesh rest in hope? Because of the resurrection. That's what Paul was getting at in 1 Corinthians 15. Saying if Christ has been raised, then there is a resurrection for the faithful. And as John said, we don't know what we'll be like in the resurrection but we shall be like him. Now he says, Because thou wilt not leave my soul in hell, better Hades, the place of departed spirit, neither wilt thou suffer thine holy one to see corruption. See, that was written in the Old Testament. The Holy Spirit's guiding Peter to properly and accurately use this from the Old Testament and apply it to Jesus Christ. Thou hast made known to me the ways of life. Thou shalt make me full of joy in thy countenance. Now watch what he does as he read this from the pen of David who himself was inspired of the Holy Spirit. Men and brethren, let me freely speak unto you of the patriarch David. He is both dead and buried and his sepulcher is with us unto this day. Years and years ago in visiting Jerusalem, the old city of David, which is to the south of the Temple Mount, we visited in what is called the Tomb of David. And while we were there, a Jewish man was there, and he was leaning with his hands upon the bier where it was supposed to be his body laid. And he was crying. One of our number, not so versed in the Bible, asked him why he was crying. And his response was, because the glories departed from Israel and King David lies here. And Messiah has not come. But Peter declares, almost 2,000 years ago, Therefore, now remember, therefore means in the light of the facts I've already laid down, let's draw the proper conclusion. And since the Holy Spirit's guiding him in these words and his preaching, along with the rest of the apostles on this day that the church started, you can be sure it's accurate. Therefore, being a prophet, that's how I know David was not only a king, but a prophet. The Holy Spirit had Peter call him a prophet. Because in the words he just quoted from David, David is speaking about Christ come. Therefore, being a prophet and knowing that God had sworn with an oath to him that of the fruit of his loins, according to the flesh, he would raise up Christ to sit on his throne. He, seeing this before, spake of the resurrection of Christ. That his soul was not left in hell or Hades, neither his flesh did see corruption. This Jesus hath God raised up 
whereof we all are witnesses. Now watch him bring this thing down to a point. Because if you read back earlier, the audience he's addressing are described as devout Jews gathered out of every nation under heaven. They're there to do what they believe was right according to the law of Moses. They didn't expect this to happen. So these are not hypocrites. These are not worldly people. They're mindful of doing God's will. They just don't know what it is. And they have in ignorance put the Son of God, Jesus Christ of Nazareth, to death. And so Peter charges them. Thou hast taken them with wicked hands and crucified and slain. But then he said God didn't leave it that way, did he? That was all in the divine plan. God raised him from the dead. Now remember what we read in 1 Corinthians. Is Paul straightened out those people, those brethren who should have known better. Therefore being by the right hand of God exalted. <coughs> and having received of the Father the promise of the Holy Ghost. He has shed forth this which you now see and hear. And you'll remember as you go back earlier, the apostles had been commanded to tarry you in Jerusalem until you be endued with power from on high. While they waited there, the apostles of Jesus Christ, there was a sound, not a wind, but a sound as of a rushing mighty wind. There's no wind. And it's coming down from heaven. And it filled all the house where they were sitting. No wind, but it sounds like. And sitting upon each one of the apostles with cloven tongues like as a fire. And they began to speak in other tongues as the Holy Spirit gave them utterance. And I know those were languages among men because there were these various Jews gathered from every nation under heaven who in their locality spoke in their own dialects. And they said, how hear we every man speak in our own tongues the wonderful works of God. Folks, that was to show that what these men were about to preach, the gospel of Jesus Christ, involving the death and resurrection of Christ, was from heaven and not from men. That's the purpose of miracles, signs, and wonders. To cause men to see, you better listen to the message. This is God's message. So... You notice he says, for David's not ascended into the heaven. That's more reasoning, saying David's speaking about somebody else, not himself. Why, he's dead and buried here this day. That Jew, back when I was over there, knew that. But in his false concept of the Messiah not recognizing Jesus Christ to be the Messiah, he still looked to the future. He didn't understand this passage. No Jew holding on to Judaism understands this passage. And yet here it is, right here, explained. Well, David's not ascended into heaven. But he saith himself, The Lord said unto my Lord, Sit thou on my right hand until I make thy foes thy footstool. Now watch how he brings all this down. Remember the people he's addressing. And all the apostles are addressing. We have Peter's sermon recorded by Luke. Therefore, let all the house of Israel know assuredly, no ifs, ands, or buts about it. The proof's in, it's conclusive. Let all the house of Israel know assuredly that God hath made that same Jesus whom ye have crucified, both Lord and Christ. And the sermon gets interrupted. You know, he told them back in the beginning, ye men of Israel hear these words, and some of them did. They listened. They understood. They realized that the miracles were not there just to be done to amaze them, but it pointed to the apostles as the ones to speak the word of Christ. And that the message they preached was right. It was the will of God. And thus to interrupt the sermon, they'd been convinced by the evidence. When they heard this, remember he told them to hear to understand, to listen, to comprehend. Now when they heard this, they were pricked in their hearts. The heart is the inward man. It's the seat of understanding. It's where understanding takes place. The intelligence, the intellect, the rational powers. It's where the conscience is. The emotions are. It's the real you dwelling in this body. It's a good way to describe the spirit, the inward man. And what happens when they understand the truth? 
You know, they thought they were there doing right. They were devout Jews. There's no hypocrisy here. Yet they listened. They understood. And the scripture says they were pricked in their heart. Their conscience got after them. So much so, they interrupt sermon. And they said unto Peter and to the rest of the apostles, men and brethren, what shall we do? And like most preachers today, they said nothing. That's not a thing for you to do. Well, they, they thought there was something for them to do. And that's in your Bible. Not just mine. What shall we do? Do regarding what? What do you charge them with being guilty as devout Jews of crucifying the Son of God? That's the charge the Holy Spirit had Peter and the other apostles lay at their feet. Now it's either true or it's false. They were guilty or they weren't. Well, would you say by their response they recognized that they were guilty? You know, Paul wrote to the church in Rome and said, and most of us here are very familiar with this passage, that all have sinned and come short of the glory of God, Romans 3.23, and that the wages of sin is death, meaning separation from God. That's the reason Adam and Eve were put out of the garden. It was a place for sinless people. They sinned and out they went. And some people have said, and God headed for Pentecost. God headed for here. God headed for sins could be fully and completely forgiven. But it took the death, burial, and resurrection of Christ. Now Peter has pointed out plainly that what David had to say wasn't about himself, but it was having to do with Jesus Christ of Nazareth. Why should they believe that? Because they had seen these miracles that no man can do except God be with them. And that confirmed the word that they preached to be from heaven and not from men. When they heard this, they were picked in their heart. They said unto Peter and to the rest of the apostles, unlike denominational preachers, men and brethren, what shall we do? And Peter didn't say, just receive Christ into your heart and then pick a church to go to that you like the best. Now that's the denominational concept. And if that offends anybody, please go to your Bible and find where the concept of be saved by Christ by praying some sort of sinner's prayer, ask him to come into your life, and then choose the church of your choice. I want to find that in my Bible. You know why I want to find it in my Bible? Because I've never found it. And I know what my Lord said about the New Testament of Jesus Christ concerning the day of judgment. He that rejecteth me and receiveth not my words hath one that judgeth him. The words that I have spoken, the same shall judge him in the last day. John 12, 48. Now, if I have in all these years missed what most people who call themselves Christians say about how to benefit from the death, burial, and resurrection of Christ, and they say, just pray some sort of sinner's prayer, and it's all taken care of, and then pick a church that suits you. If that's what the New Testament teaches, I want to believe it. Because I want to believe whatever my Lord teaches in His last will and testament. I can't find it. And I'd really appreciate it if somebody would help me find it if I've missed it. Well, Peter answered them. I, I can read that in my own Bible. You can too. In yours. When they asked men and brethren, what shall we do? Peter said, he, he didn't say there's nothing for you to do. He said unto them, because they're now believers. That's insufficient. It's necessary, it's essential, but it's insufficient. Repent. Who did you say that to? To believers. How are they believers? So then faith comes by hearing, and hearing by the word of God. Romans 10, 17. Now what have they been hearing that Peter asked them to hear? How did he begin? Ye men of Israel... Hear these words. Now why would that be necessary? Because Peter knew as well as anybody else that faith comes by hearing. And hearing by the word of God. Romans 10, 17. Now in order to have faith in Christ that is an accurate and proper faith, I must have the word of God behind what I believe. <coughs> when I say as I have uttered many times in various places, 
in preaching. When I say, well, I believe thus and so about spiritual matters, I better be able to find where the Bible says so. And if you say, well, I believe thus and so, but you can't find where the Bible says so, you don't need to believe thus and so. Because faith can be hearing. And hearing by the word of God. Romans 10, 17. So these folks, by the word of God, proven to be the word of God by the miracle signs and wonders the apostles did, have believed in Jesus Christ. But that's not all the story, is it? Now, today, people would let you think that's all there is. Just believe only, and that's it. And James 2 makes it clear that faith without works is dead, being alone. James 2, verse 24. He even argues there, saying that even the devils believe and tremble. So when a person is believed only, all they've done is reach the devil level of faith. That's all they've done. And it'll not save anybody. But a belief alone saves, the devil ought to be saved because the Bible says they believe. So these folks believe that even Peter, who's guided by the Holy Spirit, as were the other apostles. Peter said unto them, Repent. Well, that's one of the commands for a person to become a Christian following belief in Christ. Acts 17 30, Paul preaching on Mars Hill in Athens, same gospel. Because there's only one, and it's the power of God to save. Romans 1, verse 16. Yes, God's put his power to save us from our sins in the words of Christ, the glad tidings, the good news, the gospel. That's why Christ said, go into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. That's how the power of God to save gets to everybody, is through the preaching of the word of the gospel. So we're able to see that this repentance is a command, Acts 17, 30. The times of this ignorance Paul preached, God winked at. But now command us all men everywhere to repent. You can't just believe in Christ and say, I'll continue to live as it suits me, no matter what kind of sins I'm engaged in. There's a complete turnabout in the person who becomes Christian. It's called conversion. That's why it's called conversion. So unless you repent of your sins following your belief, you can't become a Christian. Those are necessary qualifications. You're qualifying yourself. They're necessary. But they're not all there is to it. Repent be baptized every one of you in the name of Jesus Christ. That is by the authority of Christ. He's our Savior. He's the way. He's the truth. He's the life. And no man comes to the Father but by Him. John 14, 6. But you're to be baptized as a believing, repentant person for the remission of sins. And most people today say you don't have to be baptized to be saved. Okay? Same Peter, years later, writing to Christians. 1 Peter chapter 3, verse 21. It says, Baptism doth also now save us. Simple language. Why can't people find it? All these learned theologians running around, umpteen letters behind their name. And they can't understand. Baptism doth also now save us. They'll tell you, no, it's belief only. Some may not even say that. I don't know really what all they do say. It's easier to learn the truth of the Bible than just what everybody else says. But you've got to study it. You've got to have what Jesus described as hungering and thirsting after righteousness. Because those are the only ones that are going to be filled with the knowledge of God. That's what he was teaching in that beatitude. And ye shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. For the promise is unto you and to your children and to all them that are far off, even as many as the Lord our God shall call. God calls people through the gospel. And people who are called by the gospel hear the message of Jesus Christ. His death and why he died, his burial, and his resurrection, and how to benefit from them, which is have remission of sins, reconciliation to God, being justified in his sight. So how is it we can read all these passages that state the resurrection of Christ? And how is it that most people believing in Christ can have special days that they can't find a thing in the world about them in the Bible. 
but they can't get Acts 2. And they can't understand that the believer is to repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sin. And they can't understand what Peter said later who preached this message that baptism doth also now save us. We make things difficult. Either because of pride, just plain ignorance of the word, or else we're trying to defend something our family has done or whatever. So my point in closing is this. If you believe everything the New Testament, well, just the whole Bible teaches concerning the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead to die no more, that's wonderful. But then you ought to also be able to read and understand the Word that tells you how to benefit from what Christ did for us that we never could do for ourselves. And that is that He could suffer, bleed, and die on the cross, for He was the Lamb of God which takes away the sin of the world. Because he had been tempted in every point like as we are, yet without sin. Thus he could go to the cross and die, not for anything he did, but for your benefit and for mine, for all of us of sin. We need a Savior. He would go into that grave. He would not decompose there. But he would rise the third day to die no more, overcoming death, hell, and the grave. And now we can preach a gospel of glad tidings. The death has been overcome. That forgiveness of sins is possible to all them who will obey Jesus Christ. Remember Hebrews chapter 5 and verse 9. He's the author of eternal salvation unto all them that obey Him. Now what is your position this morning is you've heard the word preached and if you don't think it was from the Bible you just take your Bible home and study it. I can, I can never go wrong if I say you have an honest and good heart. And out of that honest and good heart, you study the Bible. And never quit studying. Because it's going to judge you on the last day. It is the standard of God's judgment. Now we've studied what to do to become a Christian. Now as a child of God, how loyal are you to Jesus in His spiritual body, which is the church? Are you daily living the new creature life? Made possible because Jesus was raised from the dead? And you were baptized into Christ for the remission of sins and raised to walk in newness of life, a new creature in Christ. If you sin as a child of God, you need to repent of those. And God's second law of pardon as a child of God, come confessing those sins and pray God for forgiveness. Are you subject to the invitation of Christ? He said, come unto me all you that labor and are heavy laden. I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn of me. For I am meek and lowly in heart, and you shall find rest in your soul. You're subject to the invitation of Jesus Christ as taught in the New Testament. We invite you to come when we stand and sing.